Good morning, teachers and students. Thank you for being here. I'm excited about your interest in the Houston Climate Action Plan. Some of you may be asking why you're here, or how your actions affect climate change in Houston. The truth is that every Houstonian is working or can work to promote sustainable activities that help Houston become more efficient and reduce the impacts of climate change. Climate change will impact all Houstonians with the most vulnerable feeling the greatest impacts. We can anticipate more extreme heat events, more ozone action days, and more rainfall if we do not act. Failure to address climate change will lead to more hospital visits, more property damage, and lower quality of life. Hurricane Harvey was a turning point in how we view and approach climate change, sustainability, and resiliency. Houstonians have demanded that we do whatever it takes to prevent more disasters like Hurricane Harvey and plan for our changing climate. We have heeded this call and have released two plans that will be transformative for the city of Houston. Resilient Houston was released on February 22, 2020, and on Earth Day 2020, the Houston Climate Action Plan was released. Later this morning, you will learn more about the Climate Action Plan but simply put, it will address how Houston plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and uphold the Paris Agreement. We know we have more work to do, but the city of Houston has a long history of promoting sustainable activities that help us save money, become more efficient, and reduce the impacts of climate change. Tackling this challenge head on, it's necessary for Houston to protect current residents, future generations, and let's not forget, to remain the energy capital of the world. We need you, our educators, to encourage students to explore and ask questions, drive them to take appropriate steps in our community to build our resilience, talk about climate change, talk about sustainability, and teach our kids how to be change makers in their classrooms, neighborhoods, in our city, and in our country. Students, we need you to be curious, we need you to ask questions about our changing climate, study hard and help us find smart solutions. We want this process to be an opportunity to highlight the good things you are already doing and an avenue to help you expand on climate education. We know the road ahead will be difficult, but I'm confident that Houston will get it done. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will hand it off to Karen. Thanks, Isla. Hi everyone, thanks for joining this morning. My name is Karen Bishop and I'm a Senior Education Outreach Coordinator with the National Wildlife Federation and work with cities in Texas through our program, Eco Schools USA. Now we'll be looking at the first steps of project-based learning through a guided example. As Christy pointed out, we're using this as a model so you can get a glimpse of what our formal education teachers are doing in the classroom. And we're gonna ask that you put all responses during this section into the chat. So we're going to start off with a driving question. How do we integrate goals of the Climate Action Plan into our current programming? We will use this question together with the Mayor's Call to Action to identify what we know and what we need to know, as well as the skills and resources we may need to gain. Um, uh, Alicia, can you back up a second? <laughs> um, all right, so I just wanted to point out the driving question is a question that really inspires curiosity and is guiding you toward action. Um, an entry event is something like the mayor's remarks, um, or it could be a graph like this hockey stick graph that you're probably familiar with about global temperature change. Um, something that you wanna do uh, something about or immediately brings up questions as you see it. All right, thanks, Alicia. So with a uh, no one need to know, we really wanna kind of get a feeling for what concepts and skills we want to educate about. So it helps to start thinking about your program and, or programming and what you strive to share with your learners. So these concepts and skills um, and how you share them. So in National Wildlife Federation's program, Eco Schools USA, we want to help schools develop the sustainability minded leaders of tomorrow by introducing students to place based projects that challenge them to develop an understanding of the need to live sustainably. We do this through providing teachers with project-based learning opportunities through mini grants like our Monarch Heroes program, which helps schools to build native habitat for the monarch butterfly and other pollinators. Um, we also do energy audits where schools measure and reduce their energy use and our Student Resilience Ambassadors program, where schools develop a risk assessment of their school 
and community and develop a green infrastructure plan to build resilience. This last program also involves two resilience summits, one for teachers and one for students. This seven step framework guides school teams and students, teachers, communities through work on any of 12 sustainability pathways. So we must link in with the climate action plan in some way. Progress on these pathways help schools to save energy and water, reduce waste, create outdoor classrooms and improve academic performance. So what about you? Um, in the chat now, I'd like you to think about one or three concepts or skills you'd like learners to learn and how you're doing that right now through current programming or upcoming events. We're going to keep those programs and those concepts in mind throughout the rest of this workshop. So take a second of, to think about those and when you have them in mind, go ahead and place them in the chat. Right. I'm seeing lots of great things in the chat. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, you can continue to place your ideas in as we go. Um, so now that we can develop a list of what we know, what these skills, concepts, and you know events that we're working on are in the back of our minds, we can keep them there. Um, the entry event today, the Mayor's Call to Action, helps you to understand or help me to understand the city's stance with regard to sustainability, resilience, and climate action. So in particular, I learned, for example, that the city of Houston supports increased climate education in support of a knowledgeable, resilient population. So switching gears in the chat, thinking about the mayor's call to action, our driving question, how do we integrate goals of the climate action plan and resilience into our current programming? What are some things you learned from the mayor right now related to your program or programming? <laughs> All right, so we may not have a lot of background yet in the Houston's Climate Action Plan, and you're in luck because you're going to be learning more about this from Nyla Yaya from the city of Houston in just a moment. Um, so we did learn that the mayor has an ultimate goal of upholding the Paris Agreement by reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and for the city of Houston to be climate neutral by 2050. There are four overarching um, goals in the climate action plan, and that's transportation, energy transition, building optimization, and materials management. So based on these mayor's call to action and the general goals of the climate action plan, I can definitely see how Eco Schools USA strongly overlaps with the city's goals, especially in the pathways that are pointed out with arrows, uh, transportation, climate change, consumption and waste, and energy. Um, do you want to jump to the next slide, Alicia? Thank you. Additionally, we're working on four pathways through existing grant programs that I've mentioned. Um, so I think I'd want to focus on integrating the CAP language references and goals into these programs if I can. So like the energy audits that I mentioned through a partnership with Watt Watchers of Texas, uh, our watersheds, oceans, and wetlands pathway this through, the, through the Student Resilience Ambassadors Program, and our schoolyard habitats and biodiversity pathway through Monarch Heroes. So that's gonna be in the back of my mind as we go through these workshops. Uh, this workshop today, how do I link to our current existing programs? So now it's your turn again. Uh, think about the things we learned from the mayor and our chosen uh, skills, concepts, and programs, and what connections do you see? What do you know?
and continue to let those ideas percolate in your head. Um, so we've spent some time thinking about the Climate Action Plan and how it relates to our programming very loosely. You know, this is just the start. We're going to have lots of questions as we go on. Um, so speaking of question, let's turn to what we need to know and how we can get there um, as we build toward a culminating program or way of sharing our knowledge. Um, so there will certainly be some logistical or process related questions that you have in mind. Um, but in order to go beyond that, you can break your need to know into two categories, skills and content and logistics and process. And you can get to these need to knows by creating questions through a big group brainstorm, through small groups or any number of ways. Um, since we're all virtual and individual today, we're gonna work individually to create that list into our chat of things we need to know for our individual programs and record what we come up with um, down there. So the goal is to just let the questions flow. Um, a couple of needs to know for me are in skill and content, what kinds of vocabulary or research is there that backs up the link of native habitats with resilience? Or process, what partners like all of you that are joining this morning, can we connect with our educators? So this is a group brainstorm. Remember our driving question, how do we integrate the goals of the Climate Action Plan into our current programming? So take some time. Don't try to answer any questions. Don't discuss. Don't judge what's going on. But what we just want you to do is think about this question and what other questions it leads to for you. Uh, so take a minute to think about them and try to post one skills content question and one more process logistics type question into the chat. And I'll give you guys a minute to do that. All right, thank you everyone for participating so much in the chat. Um, these are great questions that you are coming up with here. Um, so the next step in this process, if we were in project-based learning, would be to stop and kind of analyze and prioritize these questions and decide on the direction that we want to go. Um, and then, you know, start thinking, what else should I be thinking about? Um, these, this is a final thought here. The needs to know are a great check-in throughout a process or the, throughout a project. Um, so how did what we learn help us answer some of our questions today? So keep those need to know questions in mind as we're going through the workshop and see, hopefully by the end of the day, you'll have more than one of those um, uh, answered or started to be answered at least. Um, and keep everything in mind as Nyla Yaya gives us a more in-depth view of the City of Houston Climate Action Plan. And I'll turn it back over to you, Nyla. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. And again, my name is Nyla Ion with the City of Houston's Office of Sustainability. Um, and my presentation today will provide an overview and update of the Houston Climate Action Plan. So let's dive in. Uh, why is Houston taking climate action? Climate, climate change poses a new threat to U.S. cities' long-term credit worthiness. Events like the Tax Day Flood, Hurricane Harvey, and Tropical Storm in Malta are pushing cities to their absolute limit. By 2050, more than 66% of the world's 10 billion people will live in cities, and more than 60% of the world's energy is likely to be consumed in cities as well. Next slide. Uh, Houston's commitment to climate action came to fruition after the United States withdrew from the 2015 Paris Agreement on June 1st, 2017. And subsequently, as a result, on June 24th, 2017, Mayor Sylvester Turner, uh, co-chair of Climate Mayors, commits to adopt the Paris Agreement goals in Houston. The image on this slide is a representation of, of climate mayors. 
which is a group of over 450 mayors from big cities and small towns, all dedicated to working with and learning from each other as we tackle climate change and work to uphold the Paris Agreement. Next slide. So with that information, let's get into the background of the Houston Climate Action Plan. So to meet the Paris Agreement, the Houston Climate Action Plan has set an ambitious goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050, which means that we must reduce or offset any carbon dioxide that we release into the atmosphere. Below, you will see Houston greenhouse gas emissions baseline for 2014 by specific sources. Energy accounts for 49%. This is our electricity use for AC, heating our homes and buildings, and transportation accounting for 47%. Houston's a car-centric city, so there's no surprise here. Um, and finally, waste accounting for 4%. Next slide. So what is the Houston Climate Action Plan? So the Climate Action Plan provides evidence-based measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and preventative measures to address the negative outcomes of climate change. The Houston CAP outlines goals, strategies, and actions that we as a city and community plan to take to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and help Houston prepare for a changing climate. Next slide. So in implementing the actions set forth in the CAP, the community and co-benefits are accessibility, affordability, resilience, cost savings, economic growth, uh, workforce development, better health, better well-being, all these great things. Next slide. So uh, the development of the CAP was and is a data and stakeholder driven process, as you can see from the diagram on this slide. So that's how uh, that went. And uh, going on to the next slide. So uh, this slide covers the CAP creation timeline. I won't go through all the dates, uh, but those were the significant dates. And then our stakeholder engagement process. So our CAP stakeholders um, engagement and dialogue process took place in form of 55 plus stakeholder meetings, 33 working group meetings, and 200 plus individual discussions with private sector um, stakeholders and subject matter experts. Next slide. Okay, so these are the strategic areas we have um, of the Houston CAP. We have transportation, energy transition, building optimization, materials management, uh, with the most important being equity present in all focus uh, areas. So this slide is a representation of challenges if we continue with business as usual. Um, the chart here is what emissions will look like in 2030, 2040, and 2050. If we do nothing, our baseline emissions will continue to grow. Okay, so next slide. And this slide shows modeling emissions reductions potential if CAP actions are implemented. As you can see, uh, emissions will continue to go up, to go down, um, and the, this is a representation of the baseline trajectory projections uh, going up if no action is taken. Next slide. So here I'll discuss the goals and strategies of the CAP. So I won't read through all of this, but um, our goals for transportation are to shift regional fleet to electric and low emission vehicles, to reduce vehicle miles traveled per capita, and to provide equitable and safe mobility choices. Next slide. And here are the uh, goals for energy transition. It's to grow Houston's investment in renewable and resilient energy systems, make Houston the leader in carbon capture technology and energy innovation, and the last being restore, protect, and enhance Houston's uh, natural uh, ability to capture and store carbon. And here is the building optimization goals. I won't read through all that. Um, this this um, presentation will be available as well, so you can go back and read. Um, and then going on to waste, um, sorry, materials management. Um, and those are our goals. So going on to the next slide. So these are the initiatives that are already in action. Um, we have Evolve Houston, Metro Next Plan, Resilient Houston, all these great things and a lot more to come.
sunny site energy uh, solar farm which is like a really really neat project um, that the that the city of Houston is in, involved in so going on to the next page um, here are a few complementary initiatives that have come from implementation of the cap uh, broken down by section so these are all the great things from transportation building optimization materials management and energy transition going on to the next page implementation okay so the office of sustainability will reconvene cap working groups uh, for the implementation phase in early 2021 um, the working groups will be a space where industry, government, nonprofit organizations, Houstonians, and Houston's youth will collaborate to implement the Houston Climate Action Plan through projects, sharing information, and resources as we are doing this morning. So this is wonderful. And going on to the next page, there's, uh, we have six working groups. Uh, transportation, energy transition, building optimization, materials management, equity, and youth engagement, which is awesome and really exciting. And um, so you may sign up for all six or just one working group by visiting our website. Um, it will be in the chat, shared in the chat, but it is also on the resources guide that's listed. Um, so please sign up. Uh, we need your help. <laughs> and then going on to the next slide. So uh, the next few slides list the CAP projects that the city of Houston plans to or has already implemented. This is, you know, things that the city of Houston um, can, can undertake. Um, so these are all of our awesome projects that are happening or have happened. Um, this is for energy transition. And then next slide will show building optimization. And next slide will show all the awesome things for material management as well. Okay, and going on to the next slide. So this is a really, really long list. And um, so for the items that the city cannot implement alone, we have our awesome partners. Um, here's a list of some of our city and non-city implementation partners. Um, and of course, more are continuing to join. Next slide. So these are our timeframes for implementation uh, broken down by what we intend to implement immediate, near term, medium term, and long term. And these are the types of actions that we um, plan to take through city policies and city codes, updating city codes and ordinances and uh, partnerships and community-led um, initiatives, of course, state and federal lobbying as well. Okay, so this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, for the sake of time, I was trying to go through everything, but this will be recorded and um, um, the presentation will also be um, available in your uh, resources guide. So uh, I thank you all for being here. Um, we don't have time for questions, but please feel free to direct message me on the chat, um, or you can email your questions to greenhouston at houstontx.gov. Um, this, this information will be available on the guide as well. So thank you all so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gina Lamott, and I'm the founder, president, and chief innovation officer of EcoRise. Um, we have a few of our team here online today, and it's exciting to see everybody here. Um, I have a, an exciting new project that we just have some um, data uh, crunched for you guys to share a gap analysis of environmental education in the Houston region. Um, and for those of you that haven't heard about the project, I'll give you a little bit of background. So. Um, Gen Thrive is an initiative that we launched here at EcoRise, and the goal of the project is really to first and foremost understand the state of K-12 environmental education, who's doing what, where, where are the resources, and how can we align them to schools that need them. In the process, we're also doing a lot of analysis about those different organizations and this, the specific details of the programs to understand how we can build strategic alliances across, within our own sector, but also um, partnering with cities, um, partnering with uh, school districts, partnering with uh, green professionals, 
And finally, using this information uh, to create new data visualization tools that can be publicly utilized and support the movement increasing you know, visibility of the issue areas and bringing in more resources. Next slide. This project um, has really been quite the, the big tent effort. Um, we've, we've asked that folks ranging from green building uh, programs all the way to children and nature programs, STEM education, um, health and wellness focused programs, all really uh, participate in helping us understand sort of the, the broadest picture possible in terms of the types of resources and education that are at play in Houston and in Texas at large. Go ahead. So the last couple of years, um, we launched this project in 2019, but in 2020, we did a second round of statewide outreach and survey distribution. And we asked folks to participate in a survey that was um, both organizational information, but also program information. Using all this data, um, we created some tools and with, throughout the entire state of Texas this year, we had captured information from 277 organizations. And since many of them have multiple programs, uh, 395 unique programs. A couple of the tools that have uh, been produced from this project, uh, the first is an ArcGIS map uh, focused on really looking at the intersection of schools and environmental education programs, but with a lens on equity, on climate risk, environmental pollutants, and workforce development. The other tool that we have is a field trends and resource directory. And this is something where I'll be sharing some of the uh, analysis from Houston from the data we collected this year. And this is just a snapshot and we'll be throwing the link in the chat box so that you can check it out as well. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in a second. Go ahead to the next slide. So within the Houston region, we had captured information from 90 different organizations that serve Education Service Center 4. <laughs> and Alicia led that outreach effort and she did a fantastic job. Um, out of those 90 organizations, 40 of them actually have their headquarters in Houston. There's a few others that are in the broader Houston region or, or East uh, Texas and the Coastal Bend. Um, but we also have a lot of organizations that are from across the state that have services and programs that uh, support Houston schools, as well as some national representation. Of those organizations, 51% uh, were nonprofit and 30 are government, 30% are government. And from the different programs, um, we have 91 unique programs that are Houston based <laughs> and serving the schools. Go ahead. So here's some of the data that we have for those programs. Um, you can see this is a breakdown of all of the different environmental topics taught within these programs. So uh, you see a very large representation of conservation programs outdoor learning, STEM education and water sort of in the middle. Um, and you can see at, towards the bottom, we have less on the, in the topics of transportation and green building. We also asked folks to tell us uh, who are their programs serving. So you can see that uh, elementary, middle and high are pretty equally distributed. Um, a lot of the programs focus specifically on supporting teachers with curriculum and professional development. And then we had a category for community and family because there's a lot of parks and nature preserves and things that host, you know, teach students obviously, but above and beyond just the youth, they also serve the entire families. Go ahead. Um, we asked questions around Title I, Title I school participation and whether there's a focus, a uh, distinct uh, focus for different programs on their outreach efforts and the students that they're serving. And you can see here that the Title I participation um, is uh, broken into um, majority, 56%, um, do not track whether or not the programs are serving Title I schools or students. Um, but you can see that there's you know, almost 9% of, of programs are serving 76 to 100% Title I students and then increasingly goes down. So that's just an interesting thing to think about. Um, you know, it's not to say that those 51% that do not track are not serving those students, but it's a question for us to ask, how are we gonna know if these students are accessing these resources? Go ahead. We also asked out of all of these different programs, um, what are the exact products, services, trainings, resources that they have to bear? Um, so we see again, the, the majority of programs, and this is based on 
you know, many of us have many different things. So we could check boxes on curriculum and field trips and all sorts of stuff, but you can see some total uh, directly teaching students is the most common or popular type of resource um, and offering that programs have. Uh, followed by curriculum, field trips, uh, professional development for teachers is kind of in the middle, classroom volunteers and presenters is in the middle, and towards the bottom is professional development for administrators and internships. So we have a bunch of other data, but sort of big picture stepping back, you know, the cliff notes is that the strengths in the Houston region is number one, you guys have a lot of programs available. Um, it's not to say that every one of them is active. It's not to say that they're active at every single school, but there's a lot of resources you can take advantage of. There's 196 programs. And I'll tell you out of all of Texas, Houston has the strongest concentration of programs available, available to, your, to your students. So that's really exciting. Um, from a topic perspective, the conservation, outdoor learning and STEM is highly represented. So there's lots of great resources, lots of uh, you know, preserves and parks and outdoor learning opportunities. Um, and great uh, resources for direct teaching and curriculum uh, resources for teachers. And then um, looking at the ages served, you saw that there's a real equal distribution between elementary, middle, and high. Um, and again, in other regions, there's typically, frankly, a, a real um, leaning towards elementary. I think probably because it's an easier audience to get into with less testing and uh, less interference and, and maybe slightly more open schedule than high schoolers. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to see in Houston that it's actually quite equally um, served. And then um, I didn't have the, the image for this up there, but there is uh, quite a blend of programs that are operating on campus in school versus offsite, and then quite a significant number that have virtual resources. And some of those may be resources that have been around for a while, and others may be some that were recently invented because of COVID this year, but uh, that's another great resource to take advantage of. Some of the gaps, um, we have, as you saw, a, a lack of focus or at least tracking of services to Title I schools. And that's something where I think there's room for growth. Um, and then we also have 45% of programs uh, having articulated how their, their programs are tracking to, this, to the TEKS, to academic standards. Um, there was a portion about 25%, of, you know, outside of that 45% that just didn't answer the question. So perhaps there's more than 45%, but of course there's always room for growth if you're partnering with schools and you can make those connections to academic standards. Um, it makes it easier for that teacher or that school to engage in the program. From a topical perspective, workforce development, air quality, green building and transportation are quite low on the list. There's not a lot of folks covering those topics. Um, of course, we know that air quality is an initiative um, and something that the city is tracking and as well as green building. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to link this to the Climate Action Plan in Houston. And finally, from a services perspective, there's not a lot of organizations that are bringing uh, small grant opportunities into the classroom or professional development specifically for administration. So there's a, quite a few that do PD for teachers, but when it comes to facilities managers or science uh, directors, uh, anybody else kind of in the universe of K-12 schools, um, that, is, that is something that there's very few of our organizations doing. Go ahead. Um, I'm not going to go through the map, uh, the GIS map as much, but we do have a breakout session later today. So um, we'll be diving into that a little bit more, but I just wanted to let you know that we do have this other ArcGIS map and it's a really beautiful tool for place-based learning and being able to zoom in to your neighborhood uh, in the Houston area and see what sort of environmental pollutants or climate risks exist there. So there's just a couple snapshots here that we can give you a little taste of that. Um, and again, it's something that is a public tool that you can access uh, on your own in your classroom, uh, integrate it into your program offerings and your curriculum and have students engage in it. Go ahead, Alicia. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and this one just shares a little bit of the climate risks, the storm surge, uh, hurricane tracks, um, along with the school programs. So here's my contact information. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions or want to talk further about this project, but we are uh, presenting as well. Um, I believe at, correct me if I'm wrong, is it 11.30? <laughs> no, 11, 11 o'clock. <laughs> Anyways, thank you. Thank you. Room. And if uh, this is 
all old information for you and you're an expert, then you should be moving into your breakout rooms to um, have work time right now. Is that correct? So are we ready to get going on? We are ready, Doty. Tell me when you want me to hit play on Kelly. Yes, let's listen to Kelly. Hi, my name is Kelly Knight and I'm an environmental systems teacher at Katy High School, an adjunct faculty member at Houston Community College's Department of Astronomy and Physics and an EcoRise teacher ambassador. 2020 has been a challenging year for schools and now more than ever, teachers are looking for high quality, hands-on and classroom ready lessons that can be adapted for both online and face-to-face -face learners. What once worked well in the in-person classroom is now not always the best option for hybrid education. We are reshaping, relearning, and redefining the very foundation of how we teach. Informal educators and programs can play a key role in supporting teachers by helping to design and share meaningful resources with local school districts, relieving teachers from being the sole creators of classroom content. As teachers adjust to this new normal of blended learning, we are already overwhelmed with juggling multiple complex responsibilities while still trying to meet the needs of all of our students. Prepackaged, TEKS aligned, ELS sped accommodated lesson plans and materials can be a critical time saver for teachers. Inquiry based activities and assessments that are grounded in real world or virtual experiences are especially valuable in keeping our kiddos engaged. In a time when many of our students are learning online or are intermittently homebound, we need these opportunities to keep them connected to the world around them. The pandemic has left so many students feeling isolated from their peers, their communities, and their routines. Activities that are collaborative in nature or involve virtual experiences, such as virtual museum field trips or virtual outside lab activities, can provide a sense of normalcy and security during the uncertainty of the coronavirus. Providing these resources to teachers is an enormous help. Resources that are easy to access, either free or low cost, and are available in digital format are ideal. This gives teachers the opportunity to quickly adapt materials and implement them directly in their classrooms. This way, teachers can spend less time on writing lesson plans and crafting activities and can spend more time on teaching and building relationships, which happens organically and informally when all the other boxes of learning are checked. This is so critically important for our students today, but we need your help from the bottom of my heart and in advance. Thank you. So, um... My name is Dodie Resendez. I am one of the specialists in the science department at Region 4. So if you are not familiar with the service center, um, we are sort of between the school districts and TEA. And uh, Region 4 includes all of, from basically south of Conroe all the way down to Galveston. And we go um, Columbia, Brazoria, almost to Winnie. Like it's a huge area. There's 49, 48 districts a bunch of charters, it's over 1.2 million students in our region. So we are almost one fourth of the state in our region. Um, so I'm glad to see that we have so many programs in our area and in our region because we have a lot of kids that we can reach and we can impact. So um, listening to Kelly's video as an educator, the, what I really honed in on is um, she shared that what teachers really need are prepackaged lessons or prepackaged activities that are TEKS aligned uh, and that have uh, supports built in accommodations for like English learners and um, special education students. So um, that was really sort of my thought in preparing for this little uh, short workshop. So as you guys are working on your programs and your projects, um, obviously, the first thing we're going to ask you to do is you, we want to see how your projects, your work aligns with the, with the CAP, right? So we have these four overarching areas and the goals underneath uh, within each area. So, of course, you're going to be looking at your project and how it aligns with the goals of, of the Houston CAP. Um, but then the other part of that and where I come in is the uh, TEKS alignment. Because in Texas, 
uh, we, of course, like any other place, instructional time is very limited. And if we want, we want to encourage teachers to provide these opportunities to their students, but it must be TEKS aligned because they don't have time to do things that are not aligned with their TEKS. So in the resource guide, there's a link to a really nice um, document that has specific science and social studies TEKS that are um, aligned with some of the different uh, goals. I'm also going to share a link in the chat to just sort of a note page I put together. Um, it's not as specific, but it lists, I thought I printed a copy. Um, it, it lists some of the overarching ideas that come from the different content areas. So like for science, science is an easy one because number one, that's what I think about all day, every day. Uh, but also most of the work that you do aligns with a lot of our science teaks with the environmental systems and uh, life science and even some of the physical sciences that we are doing with our students. So um, it's usually pretty easy to find some of the science and ways to align that. Uh, but we also want to make sure we reach out to our teachers in other content areas, especially if you are working with elementary school because so many of those teachers are self-contained and you can hit uh, lots of different content areas and they're more likely to uh, participate in those programs and get involved. So um, the document that I put in the chat, uh, again, it's just sort of a note if some of the overarching ideas in each of those content areas or some of the skills, uh, because sometimes you're going to tie it to the skills and not specifically the um, uh, content teaks. It might be the skills, especially in math and language arts, you're looking at those skills. The other thing that not everyone thinks about are your, like in elementary, they're called specials. So your fine arts, your art classes, your music classes, um, technology applications, if, if there's the tech apps, uh, computer science piece, um, and even health and physical education, if you can get them outdoors and moving around. So you know, get creative in how you think about how you can align your programs to the TEKS because you don't have to limit that just to your four content areas. Um, there are a lot of really good opportunities for those elective areas. Um, so that's definitely something to go check out if you want to uh, think outside the box. I know some people doing some STEM things that are amazing and they're working out of science and art classrooms. Uh, the other piece that she mentioned was support for English language learners and special education students and the accommodations they need. So the second page of the document I put in there just has some resources that you can refer to if you're looking for how do I incorporate supports for these special populations. Um, and I really, as an educator, I think every educator should put these, these supports into anything you do because anything that's good for a language learner, an English language learner, it's just good for every student. They're, they're best practices. So, um, I mean, I taught mostly ninth graders when I was in the classroom. All of my students were learning academic language. It didn't matter if they spoke English as a native speaker or not. Not Very few of my students had academic language. They are all learning language. So um, I really encourage to look at those. So if you're not familiar with ELPS, those are the English language proficiency standards. Uh, if you have students who are in an English language uh, program, who um, then we are required to use ELPS to support their language development. Uh, but again, these are standards. These are practices you, you should be doing and incorporating for all of your kids. And really the goal is to support students in reading, writing, listening, and speaking about whatever the content is. So uh, on the handout, there is a link to um, a web portal. Well, I'm missing an L there. Uh, a web portal that has all sorts of information. It is a page, a web page from TEA. So you can find all sorts of information about supporting English learners in Texas. Um, and then there are a couple of tools that have been around for a few years that we use in trainings all the time. One is, we call it the LIAG, the Linguistic Instructional Alignment Guide. Uh, that document, if you look through there, it, it breaks out the ELPS into the four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then there are some just suggested strategies and uh, things that the teacher can do and things the student should be doing based on their proficiency level. Uh, and then the instructional tool is another document you can go look at when you're looking for 
how do I incorporate strategies to support these learners? Um, that's a document that you can, there are specific like sentence stems that are in there. Um, there's looking at um, language objectives. I think that's listed in there too. So those are just some documents that you can use as guidance as you are planning supports for language acquisition and language development. And then for special education, there really isn't one go-to because every student is different. Um, and so we tend to promote using universal design for learning, which is not specifically for special education. Universal design for learning is uh, based on architecture, the universal design used in architect architecture. And so um, it's really about identifying what are the bar possible barriers students might face in learning and then planning to address those barriers. Um, so uh, they have these, their, their three principles are based on the why, the what, and the how of learning. And then there are guidelines underneath. So if you go to the UDL guidelines page, you can learn more about those. And then there's a page that's got links to tools and things, but it really is about how students learn, uh, what are the barriers that can prevent them from being successful learners and planning for accommodations to support them so that they're not uh, held up by those barriers. Um, and then the last part, because I know a lot of you are creating digital content, I put a link in there just um, if you're not aware of some of the accessibility principles, if you're creating web-based content, um, just some guidelines that you can use as you're creating that content and making sure it's accessible to as many learners as possible. So that's at the end of that, uh, at the end of that document. So again, this document, um, I had the sort of big ideas from science and social studies uh, and the skills from language arts and math. Uh, but if you click on the link that is in the resource guide, there are specific TEKS that are um, linked to those different concepts. All right, uh, let's see, Alicia, could you put the slides back up? I can't remember if I was going to say something else or not. You just have a slide for questions. Okay. So, so uh, do, do you want to, do you want me to show that document real quick so folks can see what's available to them when they get into that yeah, planning? Or Alicia, do you want to share what the action, like the, the TEKS alignment document? If, some, if folks are looking for something more specific, if you're like, no, I need somebody to tell me exactly what these TEKS are. Um, that that's another alternative. I tend to be kind of higher thinking, but like if you need to be, you know, it just kind of depends on what you're doing. But um, Alicia, do you have that up? Yeah, give me 30 seconds. Let's see, I've got it on, um, I have it on mine. I just opened it. So while y'all are doing your planning as you're getting ready, you can utilize both um, resources. So this is linked in the resource guide for today's workshop. Um, and so as you go through, you'll see, so here's the content area of science or for social studies. So this would be kindergarten 3A, first grade, and it's one point B, uh, second grade, third grade. ES is going to be environmental systems. Bio is obviously biology. Um, geography. So as you go through, you'll see specific TEKS. Uh, that align with each of those standards for each of those concepts. And so then Tony, what you, I have a question. Dark skills. Hey, it's Alicia, I have a question. So if I have, let's say a program virtually wild and I just kind of put my program out there on the interweb and see what, who, who wants to join, should I include in the advertisement what my teaks are? Absolutely. Um, How would I do that? Because in, uh, you know, the rest of the country pretty much is using national uh, or the NGSS. Uh, and in Texas, by law, it is legislated that we will use TEKS and nothing but the TEKS. So um, especially if they are going to have to purchase any part of your program, you really need to make sure that you have outlined the TEKS. Um, and it does help teachers when they are looking for resources 
if they, uh, a lot of times they will go look for resources and they'll go to the internet and they'll just search by the TEKS. So um, it's really helpful if you can um, post that information somewhere where it's easy for teachers to get to find. So you're saying right here that you have all of the climate action plan aligned to the TEKS so I can do some copying and pasting. You did the work for me. Yes, and if you go to the other document I shared in the chat, um, the links there will take you straight to, because here you have uh, the, the number designation, the codes for each of those standards, the student expectations. Um, and then I've linked in the other document, the links will take you to the science teaks, the social studies teaks. So if you need to copy and paste the language of the teaks, then you can go there to get the specific language. But this is a really good document just to get you going so you know where to look in the teaks, because there's a lot of them. But Dodi, you alluded to a few other things like special needs students, UDL. Do I need to link all those things too? Do I need to accommodate a lot of more students than just the standard kid in a classroom in my programming? Yeah. That's, in special education, the accommodations are going to be very specific to individual students. So it's really the best practice is to, it's just like I mentioned with UDL. If you consider what are the barriers to, generally what are barriers students might face when they're doing this activity, whether it's a language barrier, a reading barrier, a cognitive barrier, a physical barrier, um, and plan for those as much as you can up front, then um, that is going to help um, support those students. Um, if you've got text content, if it's possible to have leveled text, that can be really helpful. Um, so if you've got, you know, maybe two or three tiers of leveled text. Um, Wait, can you explain what that means to a layman out here who's never used the term leveled text before? What does that look like? So you may have like an easy, medium, and a hard version of the same text. So if you're in language arts, it's Lexile levels. I know what it's called. I don't know a whole lot beyond that because I am a science person. Uh, but I do know uh, you can find materials that are different Lexile levels. So the content and the message is essentially the same, but the reading level will be at different levels. So you can have simplified text um, or taking things like a big paragraph and breaking it into bullets that makes it a little easier for struggling readers. So there are things that you can do like that to make it, uh, to simplify things for students. So I think whatever is easiest or whatever is the easiest to read is generally the best for overall students. Um, it just depends on what you're working on. Should I highlight vocabulary words? Yes, absolutely. How would I do that? Uh, you can bold it. You can, if you're working with something digital, if there's a way that they can click on that word and see what that word means, have it read to them um, so they can hear the word, they can or read a definition of the word. Um, that's really, really helpful. What okay. about translating to other languages? Yes, and <laughs> because in Houston, obviously Spanish is the most common second language. However, um, there are well over a hundred different languages that are in HISD that are supported in HISD. So Vietnamese is a big one. Um, Mandarin is a big one. Uh, so there are a lot of different languages that are uh, used by students. Urdu is a big one actually too in other parts of HISD. So there are a lot of languages that are um, being used by students in our, in our region. So Dodie, if I wanted to write some lessons for Virtually Wild and I wanted a teacher to be able to easily convert them to whatever language her students are speaking in her classroom, what should I do to make that easy on a teacher? You, well, I mean, you can use Google Translate. I'm looking at Nicole's question here. Nicole, Nicole, hit unmute. I knew you were on here. Yeah, I can't see my chat. Come on, Nicole, how do we do it? Okay, so how do you translate it? Yeah, you're a teacher. I want, I have documents I want to write for you to use. What format do you okay. want them in to make that easy for you? Um, well, we take all of our documents, usually just the standard, if we need something translated, because it's very hard to translate to every single language at our schools and our campuses. We have students here who are, who speak Vietnamese, Spanish, uh, German, all of these different primary languages. What we do is we normally have all of our ELL, our ELL and our special pop students download a Google Chrome extension 
called Snap and Read. And it will, if you go and highlight the text after you've downloaded that, it will translate it into whatever language you want. You can have a female voice read it versus a male voice. And then um, it'll read basically everything you highlight. And then you can turn that feature on and off just by clicking it in the upper right-hand corner, which is where the extension is added once it's downloaded. Since we have Nicole and Dodie here, what other questions do you have for our teachers and our administrators specific to aligning your programs to standards? Oh, Kelly, as well. I was just going to oh, add real quick to that. Um, uh, sorry, I have a mask on because I actually have students in here today. <laughs> um, but the, the uh, shooting for the stars, another thing that would be great is um, having some of that, that orally accommodated material embedded into the lesson or embedded into these assessments. Because a lot of our students receive an accommodation where um, they have the material read to them. And so instead of a teacher having to sit there and stay up till 2 a.m. and record everything and read it aloud, if you have the time and you have someone to do that, um, that would be also a huge time saver. So you want videos, Kelly? Um, not necessarily videos, but what, what we do is like they were saying with that read and snap um, or converting uh, text to speech um, is that there's lots of different resources to do it. You know, teachers usually re read the question themselves and just have it as an audio recording that goes along. Um, but again, you know, if, if it came that way already and we had that option, it would be one less thing that we would have, would have to do, you know, outside of class. Kelly, what would make a program as a teacher, what would make you look at a program, let's say I'm offering Virtually Wild and make you go, oh, I wanna use that. Again, having all of the materials that are prepackaged so that we don't have to do a lot on the front end. Um, we talked about different reading levels, if it's in different languages, if it already comes at different lexiles for different students so that we don't have to adapt those materials ourselves. If it comes with some sort of, uh, you know, warm up or pre assessment and also comes with a post assessment. Um, even better is if it actually comes with some of the materials, you know, if there's um, accessory type like maps or pictures that we need, if that all comes prepackaged together, um, that's something that we can really use. Okay, I'm out of questions in the chat. So I'm curious out there, cyber world, put your questions in the chat or read them out loud. What do you want to know from our teachers? Oh, here you go. Hold on. I've got one for Della. So if I want to see an explanation of what a TEAK says, like if it says TEAK 2.5, where do I find that information? Dodie's going to give you the link in the chat, Della. I usually just Google science TEAKs and I find the most current one. And to allude to what Becky had said earlier, the biology, chem, and physics TEKs are under, were under revision, but that process is done. The new ones are already being voted on. Dodie's going to... Yeah, the state board yeah. has adopted... They're not going to be implemented until 23-24, uh, but they have already adopted the high school TEKs, but the final language is not posted anywhere where anyone can see it. Um, and middle school is in the process of being revised right now and that we probably will see big changes in middle school because honestly, it's a mess right now. Um, I'm putting a link in the chat again to the document that I shared. And on that page, if you click, um, the top of it will take you, the link on the very top of this page will take you to the main TEKS page from TEA. And TEKS is the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. So that's, you know, that's our curriculum standards. Um, so if you click on the top one, it takes you to the main TEKS page. So you'll find all the content area TEKS, you'll find the ELPS, all of that on that page. But if you click on science, that takes you just to science TEKS. If you click on social studies, just the social studies TEKS. Um, and even the fine arts, all of that is linked on that page as well. Okay. Um, yeah, what's your question for Nicole? Um, so in regards to TEKS and what is best for teachers and also best for students, um, just remembering back in the day when I was in the classroom, any time that I saw a TEK that was numbered like figure 13 point B didn't always um, help teachers because then you had to go look it up. Would it be helpful to have overarching themed TEKS rather than just having the number alone? Um, that would be awesome. The more detailed, the better. Uh, because like Kelly was saying, when everything is prepackaged and it's already there and it talks about like, say, sustainability is an overarching 
or say energy use and resources is going to be awesome. And then you can list the TEKS out under it, all of the TEKS that are hit so the teacher can know if this is something that they'll be able to use in this unit. Because we do, we divide our lessons and our curriculum up into units. And if that method lines with it, then we go ahead and look over it, use it or whatnot, or modify or whatever needs to be done. That's very helpful. So just to reiterate, just putting the numbers and uh, alone of the TEKS is not helpful. Having an overarching theme along with those um, numbered TEKS would be helpful, correct? Yes. I mean, adding the TEKS is awesome. That's a big help because um, I've been teaching for eight plus years and I still go into the TEA website to look up those TEKS to make sure that I'm hitting the TEKS in the activities that we do but to put in the overarching theme would be extra, extra helpful. And it'd save us a little bit of, of back work on the preparation side. That's very helpful, thank you. I have, I have a question that goes right along with that. Um, so we're talking about the overarching teaks and concepts. Would it be helpful for us informal educators that provide variety of different programs and curriculum to have a document of some sort that would break down all of our different programs and curriculum based by those TEKS concepts. So if a teacher is looking for, um, I don't know, climate change and then break it down, or if they're looking for, um, you know, energy or something, some sort like that. Definitely. And when you go in, uh, the more detailed, the better. Like say, when you go in to break down your stuff for energy, uh, there's gonna be energy consumption, there's gonna be sustainable energy, there's gonna be alternative energy. Um, so the more uh, detailed and the more units and sections you can break your topics down into, the better for our teachers. I think that's a really good ending point. Cindy, because wouldn't that be a wonderful final product to come from this workshop? We have a youth engagement com committee that's going to help us with some of this to take all of this and put it in a one big deal and go, hey, if you're looking for this, go talk to these people. And it's already TIC aligned. Yeah, I think Cindy's volunteered to be on that committee. <laughs> you, you, know, you know I'm all over this. <laughs> Great idea. Dodie, Kelly, Nicole, thank you so much. Nicole and Kelly, thanks for taking a minute out of your classroom. I'm glad you made it today. Thanks for joining us. Now we're gonna flip gears. If you want any more information about teaking, just reach out to Dodie Resendez. She knows them all by heart and she will be happy to help you do that. <laughs> only I'm, for now, once I'm they getting, change, I have to memorize them all again. <laughs> I'm gonna use that word teaking from now on. Well, it's a verb in my, in my world. Okay, we're gonna flip gears here and we are gonna bring on our next workshop. So if you would like to stick around for this workshop, it's going to be with Mr. Dan Riley from the National Weather Service, and he's going to talk about climate and weather data, in particular to Houston. So if that intrigues you, please stay here. And if you're like, eh, I already know all about it, then you can join a breakout room and work on your product that Cindy just alluded to. And we'll give us about 30 seconds of grace here for Christy to make some of those switches happen. Remember, you can hover over the bottom right-hand corner of your screen to see the breakout rooms, and you can select. Some of you have requested rooms together, so those are your own private rooms. So any room that has a number beside it is open to anyone who wants to join. And I will be broadcasting messages to you so you don't have to keep track of the time. I'll, I'll give you time warnings for when the next workshop starts. Yeah, it looks like everybody's already left our breakout rooms. So Mr. Dan, why don't you go ahead and queue up your slides and we're gonna let you get started, sir. So glad oh, to have you here today, it's an oh, honor. Ha happy to be here. First question as always, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen then. And can you see my uh, cover slide, one, one image or two? Not yet, sir. Not when, you click yet. On share, when you click on share screen, make sure you pick the one that's got your slides on it. And then go to presentation mode. Right. Okay. There you go. You've got it now, Mr. Riley. All right. All right. So okay. do you see do you see one or two windows? We see two windows. I see. There we go. Yep. There you go. You got it, sir. Take it from here. All right. So uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm already learning a lot. 
uh, about some of the things going on in Houston environmentally and as far as climate uh, preparedness and resiliency. So what I'm going to present today is just some basic science related to weather and climate. I do want to quickly advertise too to the teachers out there that we do outreach. Uh, nowadays we do a lot of virtual outreach. So if you'd like us to come into your classrooms through Google Meet or some other way, uh, we can present some basic weather and climate science uh, to your classrooms. So here's a look at our weather office. Uh, we're located in League City, Texas, uh, actually in the county owned by the uh, Galveston County and a building owned by Galveston County Emergency Management. And we're the Houston Galveston Weather Forecast Office. You can see on the upper right, uh, there's a lot of weather forecast offices across the nation. In our area of responsibility, those 23 counties in Southeast Texas, including Houston and Galveston, and all of ESC4. Uh, there's a picture in the lower left of our operations area during Hurricane Harvey. And we were working 12 hour shifts, pretty much all hands on. So you can see uh, coming in for- Mr. Mr. Dam, I think you need to share your screen with us again, sir. Oh, okay, it says I am, but let me, let me stop share. I'm seeing it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, my bad. All right. You're doing uh, it right. All right, I'll go back to it. Uh, hopefully it'll, it'll look all right. Can everybody see the uh, screen now? Yeah, that looks right. Yes. Now. All right, excellent. So there, there's the building. There's our ops area in the lower left. You can see forecasters kind of an in, uh, informal shot there during Harvey getting their forecast briefing. Um, our main job is to issue forecasts and warnings for the protection of life and property. We also brief decision makers like the mayor and others on the weather that's coming. And so first uh, question, I know this is one of, I think this is one of the teaks really, is the difference between weather and climate. Weather refers to kind of the day-to-day -day changes in weather conditions like temperature, cloud cover, chances of rain, uh, you know, weather-related questions. Will it rain today? The answer today, yes. Uh, how warm will it be on Sunday? These are all weather-related questions. Will I need to wear a jacket this evening? Uh, climate involves the longer term averages of these conditions. So a climate related question, what might be, will this winter be above or below average as far as temperature? Uh, are we heading into a drought? What kind of conditions can we expect in 10 years? Uh, how about at the end of the century? Those are all climate related questions. And my expertise is frankly more in the weather meteorology department, but I can brief the uh, climate uh, science, uh, basic science as well. So what affects the climate? Uh, the amount of solar radiation coming in, we'll talk about, about that. Uh, the global land and sea surface temperatures and their distribution around the globe drive different weather patterns. And we'll touch on that as well. The atmospheric composition, how much greenhouse gases do we have in the atmosphere? We'll talk about the greenhouse effect real quickly here also. The amount of snow and ice around the globe, it has big impacts on our climate. The amount of cloud cover, will a changing climate lead to more cloud cover? That could throw things uh, into a little bit of complication there. And then any kind of changes in ocean currents, weather patterns, the jet stream that might arise uh, as far as climate changes. Uh, that could be uh, complicated as well. And then many other things uh, not mentioned above. And I wanna give a quick example of a climate phenomena that you'll hear about, El Nino Southern Oscillation, and talk about what we're looking at now. So uh, you've heard of this, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, this is a, a well-recognized uh, climate pattern. And part of it has to do with the sea surface temperatures. And so it has two phases, El Nino in the lower left here, where we have warmer than average ocean waters in the equatorial Eastern Pacific. And then La Nina, the opposite phase, where we have colder than normal sea surface temperatures. And then we have a neutral phase, which some people call La Nada, kind of uh, uh, not, not the scientific term, but kind of in between. And so it turns out that when we have these sea surface temperature patterns, it also affects the amount of thunderstorm activity. So for example, if we have 
warmer, warmer ocean waters here, we get more thunderstorms, more convection. And then that drives uh, jet stream patterns uh, all around the globe. So this, this small climate pattern of sea surface temperatures uh, is a driver uh, for a lot of different weather phenomena. And so there, there's a link here, and, and I've got a, a list of links uh, that is in your resource folder uh, that I, I encourage you to go through. Uh, but here's climate.gov slash ENSO. And so what phase are we in now? Uh, take a look at the sea surface temperatures for the month of October 2020, and you can see certainly cooler than average uh, along the equator. So it certainly looks like a La Nina uh, pattern for us. Uh, notice also it's not strictly near the equator. We actually have warmer than average over much of the rest of the, of the Pacific. And so that can play in as well. But the bottom line is, uh, if you look at the bar graph here, the Climate Prediction Center, which is part of NOAA, uh, issues an uh, a, a, a El, uh, ENSO uh, statement. In this case, there's a La Nina advisory, believe it or not. And what, if you go to this website, you can read all the thinking as far as what's going on with El Nino Southern Oscillation. What phase are we in uh, and, and what's going on there? So. Uh, you know, I'm all about giving your students uh, all the background, you know, kind of the scientific background on these climate patterns. So if you look at this bar chart, these are actually from climate models on what phase of ENSO are we likely to be in as we go forward. And you can see no NDJ, November, December, January, pretty much 100% chance we're looking at a La Nina for this winter. Uh, and then as you go forward, uh, toward next summer even, there is a prediction of more of a neutral phase. So what does that mean for our winter seasonal forecast? Well, it turns out uh, La Nina winters, you can see here on the uh, right-hand side, uh, are typically warmer and drier on average for us here in the Southern US. And that doesn't mean we won't get cold now and then for a week or two. Uh, but it means over the average period of time, a climate measure, uh, we're looking at warmer and drier than average. And the Climate Prediction Center also produces these outlooks going ahead, you know, either by month or by season. And so you can see winter 2020, uh, the forecast from NOAA Climate Prediction Center is indeed for warmer, and, uh, warmer than average as far as the temperatures go and drier than average as far as precipitation. Now these colors actually represent the percent chance of being warmer than normal and the percent chance of being drier than normal. And so you can see these are pretty high values for us in Texas, uh, pretty high chance we're looking at warmer and drier conditions for the season as a whole. So what does that mean? Uh, and again, this is all data that you can look at real time and share with your students. Notice the date here, December 8th. 2020 recent data. Uh, this shows you the current drought status. And so if you look at the nation as a whole, uh, the Western US has been very dry to start with. And of course, we're heading into a warm, dry period. So, you know, that's real concerning uh, that we're going to see uh, expansion of the drought in the, in the Southern US and probably a worsening drought in the Southwest US. And you all have heard of all the fires they've had out there. So this all is related to climate and impacts. And, and so in the case of El Nino, we're looking at seasonal type uh, data. Drought.gov is a great website for all things drought, as far as drought outlook, drought monitor, soil moisture, all the factors uh, that go into drought. So that's another great website you'll see on your resource list. So what about climate change? Uh, and again, a little disclaimer, my expertise is more meteorology weather, um, but uh, I can certainly present the basic science. Uh, and then I forgot to mention another thing we get in La Nina years is above average hurricane activity during the hurricane season. And we certainly saw that this year in spades. Here's uh, all 30 named storms uh, that we had in the Atlantic, some satellite photos from them. The average is 12, we had 30. So the most active hurricane season on record 
uh, sort of is related to that strong La Nina uh, that we've had this year. And then uh, this is a, a document from the, the American Meteorological Society. Uh, they do a state of the climate report every year that you can access online. And you can see the Australian uh, wildfires uh, that occurred in 2019. So greenhouse effect, uh, I, we already saw the hockey stick plot presented. Uh, basically, what is going on with the greenhouse effect and why is it called the greenhouse effect? Well, in a greenhouse, uh, one thing that happens uh, is, as a glass building, it allows the sun's rays and the sun's energy to come in, uh, which comes in at a, a certain frequency. And then the heat that's emitted from inside not all of it escapes, some of it is trapped inside. And the same phenomena happens in your vehicle, happens in your cars. Uh, that's why the inside of your vehicle heats up so much more than the outside because of this greenhouse effect. The Earth's atmosphere acts like a greenhouse in this way in that it allows the sun's rays in, but some of that heat energy that's emitted back out by the Earth is trapped and, and, and radiated back down to the surface. It turns out if the Earth did not have an atmosphere, our average temperature would be about zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit globally. Uh, but because we have an atmosphere and because of the greenhouse effect, our average temperature across the Earth is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's actually a good thing that we have this greenhouse effect uh, for Earth to be habitable. Sometimes we talk about the, the, um, the global warming aspect as the greenhouse problem, uh, just because uh, um, the effect itself is not a negative thing. Uh, but this slide kind of explains this a bit more. Now, it turns out certain gases are very good at absorbing that heat and radiating it back down. We call those greenhouse gases. Probably the, the most commonly talked about is the carbon dioxide, of course, uh, and, uh, but also methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, uh, CFCs, all are very good at absorbing heat and radiating it back. And water vapor as well. Uh, not, that's not always, you know, that's a variable constituent. So, uh, you know, here in Houston, we have a lot of water vapor in the air. So that, that plays in a, a great deal. And then this kind of illustrates the greenhouse effect. You can kind of think of this, these greenhouse gases like a blanket, if you will. Uh, they, they trap some of the heat and radiate it back to earth. And to the extent that we are emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we're making this warming effect greater, you know, so that's kind of the basic science there behind the greenhouse effect. And I really want to highlight this website, uh, climate.gov. Uh, there's a data dashboard there, and you can look at all these parameters. You can look at time series, and again, uh, this website is on your link. Uh, so let's take a look at some of those. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions are on the rise. Uh, as our concentrations in the atmosphere, meaning since the industrial age, we're, uh, we're emitting more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. And what we're seeing in purple here is the change in concentration over time since about 1750. So it was a fairly flat. And then along about the turn of the century, around 1900, you can see that rise in the observed concentrations in the atmosphere. And then the blue line represents the emissions. So it, it, it tends to follow the increased, uh, increased emissions uh, that, we're, um, that, we're, um, that we're seeing from human activities. And then uh, this is kind of that famous uh, carbon dioxide plot over the last 800,000 years. And you're probably thinking, well, how on earth do we know that? Uh, these are based on uh, soil samples you can get uh, in ice cores. You can actually, uh, by, by analyzing uh, that data, you can actually see uh, what, uh, you can infer what CO2 levels were like uh, ages ago. And so you can see there is some natural variability here, um, you know, with minima, you know, maybe around 200 parts per million. And then uh, there was a peak, uh, uh, you know, about 300,000 years ago, up around 300. And then as we get to the modern age, look at this just drastic rise. So 
In 2019, we're up to about 410. As far as we can tell, the highest we had gotten uh, over the last you know, million years uh, was 300. So we're in uncharted territory here. And that's again, based on uh, human emissions of CO2. Uh, so let's talk about some of those elements of the climate cycle. Uh, sometimes you'll hear, well, our solar, our, our climate is driven by the sun. You know, that's the dominant factor. Uh, our sun is a little bit variable. Uh, it has a solar cycle of about 11 years. So it's sort of brightening and dimming over that 11 year cycle. And you can measure the amount of solar energy coming into the atmosphere. And you can see since 1960, you can actually it, you can see that cycle uh, playing out, uh, but it's not a huge fluctuation and there's no trend in this. It's sort of a fluctuation around a mean. Uh, so what that means is when we're in an active solar period, which also is characterized uh, by a lot of sunspots, we're getting a little bit more solar radiation uh, than, we're in a, than when we're in a quiet phase. Um, so this is not, we don't think, the, the, the main driver of long-term warming, uh, but it can have an effect. In fact, there is some belief that back in the 1800s, during a little ice age, uh, the sun went through a sort of a long quiet period, and that may have played a role. Uh, there's also kind of a neat, this is kind of more of a gee whiz uh, website here, where you can take a look at the sun today. Uh, so this is actually some imagery of the sun yesterday. And you can see that lonely sunspot there uh, on the sun's surface and some of the uh, emissions uh, coming off the sun. So this is kind of an interesting thing to look at, uh, but indeed we are in a quiet phase of the solar cycle. And there you see just uh, one sunspot. So temperature change, uh, we talked about the CO2 and how scientifically it should drive warming. And you can actually see uh, how the earth is warming. Uh, this plot here, again from climate.gov, shows the uh, temperature data since the late 1800s. And there was a little bit of cooling there and then a steady rise really uh, since uh, about 1940. Well, really since about 1910 with the industrial age. And you can see some fluctuations there, but certainly since 1980, it's just been slow and steady. Uh, we're up to, on average, about one degree Celsius of warming if you take the whole globe as an average. You can also break it down by regions, and that's what this map is showing here. So where is the warming occurring the most? Uh, that would be in the high la polar latitudes. Uh, so, you know, here in Texas, you know, maybe we've seen uh, a half a degree warming, uh, but it may, in some cases in the higher latitudes in the Arctic, uh, you know, several degrees. Uh, and that's why you may be hearing about things like big changes, you know, near the poles as far as ice melt uh, and habitat change. Uh, it's because the warming has so far really been felt more at most in the higher latitudes. And then you can actually look at a plot of the past warming, and then you can use a computer model to break that down by natural causes, meaning volcanic and solar. It turns out if we have a volcanic eruption and there's a lot of ash in the atmosphere, that's a cooling effect. You can do sort of some back modeling and see and break down the natural component to the human and natural component. And you can see that the human, when you add in human effects, uh, it tracks very well with the observed temperature changes. So that's important to evaluate the models going forward. You, when you have confidence in the model here based on the past data, you can then look forward at changes. And, um, and so that's the, the, the benefit of this, uh, you know, really since the, the turn of the century there. And um, this is due to two factors. One, the added water from the ice melt, uh, but also thermal expansion. It turns out if you warm the ocean, it actually expands slightly. The, the, on the molecular level. So uh, those two factors play in and we're looking at uh, really several uh, centimeters of rise even since 1990. Now you can take numerical modeling based on uh, greenhouse warming and ice melt 
And by the way, the ice is melting at a more rapid rate than some of the initial models were showing. Uh, you can come up with scenarios on how high the, the sea level rise might be in meters in this case. And these are based on different greenhouse gas emissions. So it's great that we're taking action now because we can limit uh, if we can get uh, the, the whole, uh, all of society to, to come in on this, we can get lower sea level rise. But if, if we keep with business as usual, by the end of the century, we could be looking at several feet of sea level rise, which would inundate uh, a lot of our populated areas along the coast. Uh, this is another tool I wanna uh, show y'all. Uh, this is called a sea level rise impact viewer from NOAA. You can go here and pick an area uh, around the country, including Southeast Texas. In the slider bar, you can actually see the, the flooded areas based on different uh, sea level rise scenarios. So let me give you some examples of that. Uh, so here's the idea. Uh, if you say, say you get two feet of sea level rise, you can see uh, the areas around Galveston Island that then become underwater and even on uh, Galveston County four feet. All right, so you can, you can kind of just do that all the way up to, you know, 10 feet or so uh, and see what the impacts are going to be. And you could pick any, any part of the country and kind of play with that sea level rise viewer. So I, I would encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, impacts of sea level rise are already being felt. Uh, many coastal communities are already seeing more episodes of nuisance coastal flooding uh, with high tides. Uh, you can see uh, some, some uh, bar charts showing the frequency of that and the frequency of National Weather Service flood advisories too in brown uh, for some different areas of the coast, including Corpus Christi. So we're already seeing some of these minor effects. And if you couple that with a hurricane and storm surge, uh, you're increasing the severity of that as well. The other thing I want to point out quickly here is uh, the possibility of more heavy rain events. And you can uh, go to this NOAA Atlas 14 and look at the recurrence interval for uh, different heavy rain events. So you can say, what's my 100 year rainfall, meaning a one in 100 year chance of getting that rain at a point. And this has recently been updated in the last few years. And you can see uh, different, around Houston, we're looking at 16 to 17 inches in 24 hours as being kind of the 100 year event based on the new data. Now, this climatology was recently updated a few years ago, and it took into account things like Tax Day, Memorial Day, and Harvey. And you can see the difference chart here based on those recent events. Um, that 24 hour, 100 year rainfall event for 24 hours actually went up considerably. So uh, there's some question whether you can say Harvey is due to climate change. You know, scientists are looking at that. It's a field called attribution. Um, but what you can say is with climate change, there's more likely gonna be heavy rainfall, high rain rates, and those events uh, will become more common. So just the last slide, and then we'll take uh, some questions. Uh, what are we looking at in the Houston area? Uh, you know, more coastal flood events. Um, how, how big the sea level rise impact uh, will depend on actions really taken now. Uh, possibly more heavy rain and associated flood events. Uh, again, there's year to year changes just based on weather uh, patterns, uh, but we think based on the climate changes, uh, that's gonna become more and more likely and more common. More extreme heat waves, uh, fewer, uh, less severe cold spells. And then as far as hurricanes, we didn't talk about that much, but I, there's a lot of debate on this. Uh, the thinking is we probably won't see more hurricanes, but we'll see more stronger storms and more that are rapidly intensifying. So that's kind of the scientific consensus now. So uh, last thing, I want to just kind of show this resource sheet uh, that I've shared with you all uh, with all the links we've talked about and more, and I'd encourage you to kind of play around with those. There's some lesson materials, things that teachers can use, and there's my email as well if you would like to reach out to me. Uh, with that, I don't know if we have time for uh, some questions, a few questions at least. Actually, Mr. Dan, because I think you're going to get inundated with questions, we're going to take them in two formats. Okay. First off, I'd love, folks, if you have questions for Dan, would you send him a direct message in the chat and he can try to answer some of those.
by text. And Christy is going to put Mr. Dan in a, in a breakout room. Right. Michelle, do you want to go ahead and share this first slide? Yeah, I'm going to share this. Sure working on that side. Great. Hello again, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm Gina Lamont. For those that didn't meet me this morning, um, I'm the founder, president, and chief innovation officer of EcoRise. And I'm going to present a little bit more of the tools um, from this morning, but we'll be able to actually dig into them a little bit and I can share uh, a quick tutorial on how to utilize them. Um, but just in case you weren't able to make this morning, I'm gonna do a very brief overview again of just the little context of the project. So go ahead with the slide. So today's agenda, um, uh, just quickly, we have 30 minutes, now we have 25 minutes, um, and we're going to jump into some of the GenThrive tools that you can utilize to be able to um, analyze which communities uh, are at most risk from climate, um, climate change in Houston. And uh, then Masha will go ahead and share some of her amazing work on the ground. Uh, and then we'll have a good amount of time, hopefully, for just questions and, um, and discussing as a community. Go ahead. So uh, EcoRise is a nonprofit organization. We're actually based in Austin, Texas, um, but we do serve lots of schools, 1,400 throughout uh, the country and, and quite a few in the Houston region. Um, and we have uh, you know, curriculum and professional development and all sorts of goodies like many of you do um, that is really focused on teaching environmental literacy, green building, uh, student leadership, and social innovation. But this Gen Thrive project has been a project in the works for the last couple of years, and it's really meant to be a public a uh, tool and database and collaborative effort that is really an asset for everybody at large in Texas. Go ahead. The purpose of GenThrive is to first understand uh, what is the state of K-12 environmental education, what sort of resources are out there, uh, who are the different organizations, where are they based, what types of programs are they offering, and how can we work together to build strategic alliances among ourselves as well as with school districts, and um, the government, various government agencies, funders, business folks. And lastly, we are using data visualization tools to really um, illuminate new places, uh, new connection points, I would say, between environmental education and health and uh, climate change and environmental pollutants and workforce development and equity. So these are some of the tools we're gonna be able to share with you real quick. Go ahead. The project itself um, spent a couple of years, but particularly this last year, doing a real sweeping analysis of all of the organizations that are active in the state of Texas. Um, and we had 277 organizations that submitted their information about their environmental education programs, which each had collectively 395 unique programs. So in the Houston region, as I had shared earlier to this morning, uh, we had 90 organizations representing programs that are active in Education Service Center 4. Uh, 40 of those organizations are Houston-based, and collectively among all of these, there's almost 200 unique programs and resources that are available to Houston schools. So we're going to throw um, this link in the, in the chat box in a little bit, um, but this is a little snapshot of what you're gonna see when you land on the EcoRise website. And I'll, I'll go ahead and um, screen share in a second and we'll walk through those tools. tools. Um, but if we go to the next slide, I'm just gonna share two out of the four tools, right? So the first one we're going to review is the Field Trends and Resource Directory. And this is a way to search uh, various resources that are available to the Houston community. The second one, which we'll spend a little bit more time on is the following slide, which is the Climate Equity and Education Map. And this is a place where you can look at where the schools are located and how that is related to a lot of other data sets and issue areas, um, which is really fascinating and has a lot of different application to help us bring these types of resources to the schools that need them most. I think that um, I'm going to screen share now and, oops, if you can stop screen sharing, there we go. Um, bring you on over to, Alrighty. Okay, so this is the site um, that the link is, uh, I believe in the chat box by this, at this point, but don't play around with it yet because I want you to be able to see how to use it. <laughs> um, here we have a little bit of an overview of the project and you can quickly see how to use these resources. So here's just some of the most common user 
um, cases, if you will, for service providers. So that would be folks like EcoRise and many of us on the call that have environmental education programs that we offer to youth. Um, there's also ways that educators can use this, both at the district level and, and teachers in the classroom. And then there's the community at large. And the little snapshot I showed you before are these four pieces here. So one thing to note is that we have little video tutorials for each one of them. So anybody that you share this with, or if you need to review it again, can quickly see how to uh, navigate these different source resources. And two of them that I'm, I'm not going to show today are the program provider network map, um, which is Kumu, a Kumu product, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, and the other one is the K-12 climate policy map. And that is a national look at climate action policies across the US. And then you'll see these four bars. So the teal climate equity and education map is the teal bar here. And these are each collapsible little windows. So you can go ahead and uh, check out these different resources and go ahead and close them again. So I'm gonna jump over first to the dashboard. And here's what the dashboard looks like. So what you will notice here is that you have some filters on your left-hand side and you're able to search by region and all sorts of other things. So we're gonna look at which programs are available in ESC4. And you'll see that this will change all of the different records here. Um, we have an organization record dashboard here. So you can see all of the different organizations. You can export this entire file. And then here's all of the programs that those organizations offer. And again, you can scroll down to the bottom and export. Now, if you go back to the dashboard, you'll see that there's various charts. And um, I will just mention that these, this entire dashboard is brand new. <laughs> We're still making some small edits on some of the display terms and some of the way that you search these things. But um, all of these, the information is all accurate. Um, we're gonna be tweaking the display just a tiny bit. But you can see you can change the different um, charts that you're looking at. So you can see very quickly in the, for all programs in the Houston region, here are, here's the breakdown of the sectors that those organizations are coming from. Here are the environmental themes that they're teaching. And you can export um, these different images even with the little camera uh, download button here. But you can also search even farther. So you could say, you know, I just wanna see beyond those that are in Houston, I wanna see the ones that are specifically tackling uh, energy education and that have um, programs that are targeting high school students. And all of this data will change and so will your different records here that you can export. So that's something that we hope to continue to grow and have more and more participation uh, included in here. But it's a resource for you to just essentially match make the type of um, various programs that you would like to search or for that matter, partners you may like to find that have complementary programs to your own. Now, when it comes to climate data and being able to really analyze um, how we can ensure that our programs are as relevant as possible and getting to the students in communities that are of highest need, you can utilize this, uh, this map, which again is called the Climate Equity and Education Map. I just wanna show you some of the navigation tools over here. We have a little schoolhouse, we have a little planet, and we have three little people <laughs> representing community. And here you can see all the different subtopics and data layers you can turn on and off. So you can turn on where are all the lead certified schools. You can see the um, organization headquarters are the red dots. Um, you can see the program density based on Education Service Center. Um, but the part that has to do with climate is over here, which is the layers on um, major hurricane patterns, uh, flood hazards, storm surge, um, hazardous waste. And as you look at all of these different data sets as they all start populating, you can click on them and learn more about these particular sites. So when it comes to Houston, we can zoom in. And I'm not gonna demonstrate a ton, but this is the tool that you can play around with on your own. Um, but you can see there's obviously a lot of industry, um, obviously the risk of hurricanes and storm surge. Um, so you can turn these things on and off. And then alongside that, you can also go to demographics and you can open up information about um, the population, the median household income, the diversity, and the social vulnerability of communities. You can also look at asthma rates, obesity rates, diabetes, voting patterns, and some infrastructure 
and green space data sets. Um, last but not least, I just want to share that a year ago when we did this before COVID, we were able to actually track where all of our education programs were happening. And we were able to um, create a heat map to be able to share which schools have multiple programs, which ones only might have one or two. Um, and as you search each of these, you could toggle and look at the exact program that was active there. There's eco schools. Um, so this is something we're going to uh, collect data on again this year after COVID, next year I should say, after COVID is over. So we can really get a strong idea as to where all the schools are and which ones have active environmental education programs. So the last thing I'll note is that this is also a great opportunity for organizations like ours that are serving schools to say, you know, let's use this map to make sure that our environmental education programs are place-based and that we are addressing the various environmental hazards and climate risks that are in the backyards of these of these students or of, their, of the school campus. So it's a way to really kind of customize and localize environmental education uh, for our students. So I'm gonna stop sharing and let Michelle take over, um, but we'll be able to take questions and answers after that. And it looks like, I'll go ahead and put that link in the, in the chat box again. Great, thanks so much, Gina. So uh, kind of just a little bit of an introduction of the work that I do in Houston. So I'm an environmental scientist and also an informal educator. So a lot of my uh, learning has been about identifying risks that people in vulnerable communities face and communicating that risk. So how do we communicate the risk that people face when we identify health and human risk assessments and we conduct those? So uh, being able to do that type of risk management and being able to effectively communicate uh, the risk that communities that are vulnerable or fence-line communities that they face. Um, so risk is a two-way two communication. So in order to be able to communicate and mitigate some of the risk, we, I've, uh, over the past few years, sort of kind of dived more deeper into understanding what those relationships need to look like. So how do we engage with at-risk youth that are in vulnerable fence-line communities? So uh, the communities that I've I've taken two examples to talk really quickly about some of the ways that I've engaged with community members in a vulnerable community. So the fence line community that is in East Houston that is identified as Manchester is really right next to the Port of Houston, as you can see here. And this is a screenshot I've taken from the EcoRise Gen Thrive. So I'll, I've been playing around with that since I found out about it. So this is uh, Manchester. This is, as you can see, there's the Port of Houston, there's Valero, and there's, I mean, there's the rail yard. So, you know, um, all of these high schoolers they have, or the elementary school students, they have high risk of asthma and they have a lot of air, air pollution related health issues that uh, residents face. So those are some of the trends that I've seen over the past few years and really being able to check in with the community and see how we, they can mitigate. So along with that, you can see here, Again, East Houston, you can see all these refineries that I've outlined here and then these TCQ air monitoring sites. So as you can see, these TCQ monitoring sites, while they're really great and robust in collecting data, that's not enough to be able to get a complete picture. So there's a lot of effort in Houston that's being done as far as like data collection, localized data collection, using those Google cars to be able to um, collect data on the streets. Um, so how do we partner with community educators? How can we create a city essentially in Houston, understanding that climate risk and members. And how do we, so some of the questions that we wanted to kind of uh, understand from the community perspective is how do communities experience or what was their experience of Hurricane Harvey? What did that recovery process look like for that specific community? So kind of having like a hyper-localized uh, lens on the disaster recovery process. And maybe we can be, be when we do that type of uh, data collection, with community input, maybe we can have better, uh, be identify better gaps that that can help um, prepare us uh, and prepare communities and build more resilience from the ground up. So what does that res disaster recovery process look like? So when we did that uh, study, we got a grant and we partnered up with five community members um, so we train them to do that type of data collection. And these are residents that you can see. And this is Northeast Action Collective, this community organization that has been formed ever since Harvey. And these are some of, uh, that's what the research process looked like because of a hurricane heart. 
sorry, because of the pandemic, it's been a little bit challenging to actually, we weren't able to do this the way that we would have inten intended. So we had to do a lot of the interviews uh, virtually, but we interviewed 21 residents um, in Cashmere Garden Scenic Woods and we're able to kind of understand what the disaster recovery process has been for these residents. So community members did one-on-one -on -one interviews with their neighbors, their family members, their extended network. And, you know, uh, for some of us, Hurricane Harvey just happened and it ended, but for a lot of people in East Houston and other parts, it's still ongoing. So the disaster in their mind hasn't ended and it's an ongoing thing that uh, whether it's its long-term health of impact or the mental health impact. So this is just like a screenshot of like the, how many people think that they actually have not recovered from Hurricane Harvey? How many people have still had to live in damaged homes or are still living in some form of damaged home that needs to be repaired? And what the negative mental health impact. So that was something that was really kind of eye-opening for us that there's actually 19 out of 21 people that have identified having serious mental health impact because of Hurricane Harvey. So, you know, being able to identify these from a community perspective and kind of tackling that as well. Um, so these are just kind of some of the takeaways that we found from our research and what the suggestions were from community members, because we asked them what they would want and what they imagine a complete recovery for their community to look like. And some pictures of, um, you know, how they actually had to come in and support one another because maybe uh, emergency management wasn't there in the time or that communication wasn't there um, for certain communities and being able to understand why that is so and what are those trends. So understanding those structural barriers to recovery is what we've identified it as like class, race, geography, and that talks about, about the a lot of those communities being considered sacrifice zones. How do we build trust within disaster systems and during non-disaster times? especially considering Houston in the wake of climate change is going to be uh, facing a lot of these issues. Um, so lastly, how do we utilize data and bridge these gaps? So once we identify all these trends and we kind of go in, how do we, how do we keep engaging with these communities? How do we keep having those conversations? How do we effectively have a just climate action? for Houston. So some of the things that we've been involved with is engaging youth in climate action. So I know that Naila has mentioned that before, but we're also helping recruit the city um, for youth and equity working groups. So we'll drop, I, I'm sure that's a link in the chat so you can share that with your network. We're gonna be having an informal kickoff meeting for the youth working group to be able to educate and empower communities. How do we identify community-wide gaps? What are, what are, what are more data what is the data that we need to collect to be able to do effective policy change? How do we advocate for that? How do we partner with local organizations and build that community level trust to be able to, as educators go in and effectively communicate with residents what they want that process to look like? And basically having a multidisciplinary approach to finding solutions for communities. Um, so really partnering up with all those incredible tools that Gina shared uh, with EcoRise, I think that's a, a really great step as well. And hopefully some of the resources. So these are our contact information, but I also put some resources together with the local organizations that I've been involved with in Houston to, to be able to connect with community organizers and community educators essentially um, to bring about climate action in Houston. So thank you. And with that, I think I sped through a lot of that, but we have five minutes and I'd like to open it up to questions have to transition us because our next speaker is here and ready for us. So thank you, Gina and Marshall. And so thank as you. we transition here, if you'd like to stay for our last workshop, it's going to be about how the CAP is being integrated into industry. And so Jane is going to join us from BP. And if that's not of interest to you, then feel free to join any of those breakout rooms where you can work on projects like Karen just came up with her project. You can take some time to run that by somebody else in your breakout room or flesh it out. And then if Jane is here, there you are, Jane. I am here, hopefully you can Hi. hear me. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen and you can, you've got the next 30 minutes, ma'am. I am sharing, make sure I share sound. Let me put this in presentation mode. 
Can everyone we, see? Looks great. Here's, we can hear you great too. Take it. Fantastic. So just by way of a uh, brief introduction, I just want to let everybody know who I am. I'm James Tricker. I'm BP's Senior Account Manager, supporting our partnership with the City of Houston. I've been with BP for about 20 years now in a number of different roles, but I, I have to admit that this is probably the most exciting role um, that I've been asked to do, um, supporting Houston as it uh, implements this um, super ambitious and um, what much needed climate action plan. So in February of this year, BP announced its ambition to become a net zero company by 2050 and help the world achieve net zero also. So when Houston did the same with the release of its cap in April, we saw an opportunity to support the city in those aligned objectives. So we've committed resources and support to the city over the next four years to help them in the implementation of the cap. One of the ways that we're supporting the city is by helping to promote and educate people about the CAP and drive participation. So my goal today is really just to share with you some of the actions that industry is taking to support climate action plan implementation in Houston. Um, but more importantly, also just to provide you with some hopefully helpful information and resources to support your CAP uh, related education programs. So I tried to think as I was putting this together about what would really be useful to each of you as educators and, and education outreach partners in, in pulling uh, these materials together. So I'm hoping that you find them useful. The materials will be made available uh, to anybody who'd like access to them. So in um, BP attended the, the 2019 One Young World Summit uh, and spoke about the, the global challenge of climate change. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with One Young World, it's an organization that identifies, promotes, and connects the world's most impactful young leaders to create a better world with more responsible and more effective leadership. So they host an annual summit bringing together young people from around the world to accelerate social impact. Recognizing that so many people are visual learners, BP worked with a team that illustrated the dual challenge uh, that the world is facing while our chief economist spoke about it. And I love this slide because I think it really brings to life um, the, the challenge that we're facing with climate change. Um, and so as a result of its success in engaging such a broad range of people, we continue to use it as a way of explaining the different elements of the energy system, uh, some of which I'll talk a, a bit more about later. But I think the key messages I'd share from this illustration are that, that one, the world is facing a dual challenge. Um, we've talked a lot about the climate challenge side of it uh, so far this morning, but there's really two sides to this dual challenge. Um, the, the need for energy around the world does continue to grow as developing countries improve access to the most basic energy for light and cooking. Um, but at the same time, we also need to reduce our emissions uh, around the world to keep the planet safe from climate change. And so in that, everyone has a role to play in this challenge. Uh, governments, corporations, and individuals. Each of us must take action to meet this challenge. And it's really just through that cooperation and not polarization that this change will happen. And then we also have to make sure that as we change, we don't forget those with the least access to affordable and clean energy. The solutions developed have to be good for everyone and not just some. So just like in the global view with the success of Houston's climate action plan depends upon support from everyone, not just Mayor Turner or City Hall. So everybody has a role to play, including the energy industry. And Houston is home to more than 4,500 energy firms. It's only through everybody playing their part and working together that the city will actually be able to achieve its ambitious goal of net zero by 2050. And that's why BP has made partnerships with cities and corporates a key part of our new strategy. And this brief video that I'll share uh, highlights how BP is working to help support the city of Houston and other cities to meet their climate goals. Here in the city of Houston, we announced our very first climate action plan with the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050 in line with the Paris Agreement. 
We're very proud at Microsoft about our net zero ambition. We announced that by 2050, we're committed to having erased the entirety of the carbon footprint of the company since its inception. We've got a clear vision for Aberdeen City. It's driven by a desire to diversify our economy and respond to climate change. We've developed a net zero vision to make sure that we are an exemplar for energy transition. Houston is very much a car city. We are also on a major highway thoroughfare. So vehicle electrification is a huge opportunity, but that's also a huge behavioral shift. We see that there may be operational and technical constraints around us delivering that vision. We believe that if we can get that collaboration and partnership working, we can deliver for the city of Aberdeen. As energy demands increase, the pressure associated with creating um, clean technologies is only increasing. The challenges uh, associated with this strategy, uh, first and foremost, is that a lot of the technology that we depend on in our approach has not yet been invented. It's also a, a play into just why our partnership with BP is so critical. We're incredibly excited to have been chosen by BP to work in partnership with them. We know that they've got um, uh, plans to work with uh, 10 to 15 cities around the world but it's fabulous news that Aberdeen is going to be one of the first cities and we can't wait to get started. Climate change is a global challenge and it will take a global solution. When you have any type of climate emergency, we can't do it alone. And we are grateful for BP's support for our climate action plan. We believe that technology can solve some of the problems that Microsoft can't do it alone. BP are the energy experts here, and um, by teaming together and bringing the power of our technology portfolio to all of the expertise uh, in the industry at BP, we can solve problems um, that we wouldn't have been able to solve as separate entities. We really do believe that we can make an impact for a better world tomorrow. So as Nyla mentioned earlier, um, there are four areas of focus within Houston's Climate Action Plan. And within each of these focus areas, some more than others, industry is playing a role in helping the city achieve these goals. So over the next few slides, I'll just provide a few examples of some of the actions that industry, uh, including BP and others, are taking to deliver on Houston's CAP goals. So in the area of transportation, um, as mentioned in the video uh, by Laura Cottingham, uh, emissions uh, associated with transportation in a city the size of Houston are a significant challenge. Um, accounting for almost half of, of Houston's emissions, um, this is one of the biggest challenges that they face. And so uh, one example of, of public-private partnership and, and coalitions and in industry coming together with government is uh, the Evolve Coalition. And so Houston has a goal of reaching 30% EV transition uh, by, by 2030. And so the mayor put in place a coalition between the city, Shell, NRG, Centerpoint, and U of H and LDR working together to develop a roadmap to achieve that 30% uh, new car sales in Houston by 2030. But having that, requires the development and installation of a publicly available EV charging infrastructure um, to reach that goal. And so industry is working, companies like Shell, BP, NRG, and others are developing the technology and capability that will provide a charging infrastructure to support the electrification of vehicles. And then car manufacturers are releasing more and more electric vehicles each year um, I think we expect to see uh, pickup trucks to be the next one, which, is, which will be critical to Houston uh, as, as being a truck city. Um, and so uh, to achieve this uh, goal, energy companies, automobile manufacturers, engineering companies, all will come together and work together to, to provide the charging infrastructure uh, in the vehicles. And it's important that, that both the infrastructure be accessible in all Houston neighborhoods and that vehicles be affordable for all Houstonians. 
In the energy transition area, um, obviously one of the primary um, areas of focus is on renewable and clean energies. And as I as noted in the earlier slide, Houston is home to over 4,500 energy companies. And within that number is an ever increasing number of companies who are focused primarily on renewable and clean energy. But in addition to that, traditional oil and gas companies and service companies are also expanding and diversifying into uh, renewable and clean energies. In many instances, the same skills and capabilities that are needed in traditional oil and gas jobs are also useful in the areas of clean energy technology, like solar, wind, and other energy technologies. Houston's long been considered the energy capital of the world, and now it has a new goal to become the energy transition capital of the world. And the Climate Action Plan has a goal to make Houston the leader in both carbon capture technology and in energy innovation, including attracting 50 new Energy 2.0 companies by 2025. More and more innovative technology companies who aim to bring innovative solutions to address climate challenge are calling Houston home. Uh, and I think one of the most exciting projects on the horizon in renewable energy is the Sunnyside Landfill Solar Farm. It's being developed by BQ and Wolf Energy. This 50, watt, 50 megawatt solar project, once completed, will be the largest urban solar farm in the US and will also bring affordable solar power to the Sunnyside community. As noted, the CAP calls for Houston to become the leader in carbon capture technology. So in addition to focusing on clean and renewable energy, work is being done to address the emissions that are harder to reduce because they depend on fossil fuels for processing. This includes things like industrial processes, steel, cement production, chemical production, and, and even power generation. Houston's port, ship channel, and industrial port are examples of these places where the emissions are going to be harder to address in the near term. Um, and so to address these emissions, industry has been developing uh, carbon capture technologies that capture CO2 emissions at the source before they can be released into the atmosphere. And then those are either stored uh, safely deep underground or could be used for other products like the production of, of carbon fiber. So the illustration in the slide is again, one of our energy illustrated graphics that provides a super simple, straightforward way of explaining CCUS um, to folks who may not understand it or know how it works. Um, this technology, according to pretty much um, every climate analyst, every uh, energy, long-term energy analyst, this technology is going to be critical to achieving that zero emissions. Um, and so, uh, it, the other benefit is that it has the opportunity to help create hydrogen, which can be another uh, clean energy source. And so in the long term, hydrogen is seen as an alternative source of energy for some of the processes that I described in the previous slide. It also has the potential to be a clean fuel option for heavy trucks and ships uh, where electrification isn't necessarily the best solution. So again, this slide focuses on explaining the difference between the three types of hydrogen. Green hydrogen, which is uh, electrolysis creates, uh, created through renewable power. Um, and so that's the cleanest of the, the approaches to hydrogen that leverages uh, solar and wind to create hydrogen. Um, blue hydrogen, which is processed from natural gas or coal that has CCUS attached to it. So this, the um, the carbon dioxide ends up in, uh, in storage and then the hydrogen becomes a fuel. And then gray is what exists today primarily, which is processed from natural gas and creates CO2 emissions. And then finally, in the area of energy transition, the other option um, is in natural climate solutions. So this is another area where industry is developing effective solutions to address climate change. Um, natural climate solutions and carbon offset programs provide uh, two key benefits. First, they provide a way for companies, individuals, and governments to reduce their climate impact 
immediately, uh, even if they can't directly eliminate the emissions associated with their activities. Offsets generally come in the form of credits that are purchased that are equal to a certain volume of CO2. That purchase of those credits then are used to fund projects that naturally re reduce CO2 from the atmosphere. So things like forestation projects, soil management projects, um, and other such projects that, that will reduce the level of emissions in the atmosphere. Natural climate solutions typically include conservation, restoration, and improved land management actions that increase carbon storage or avoid greenhouse gas emissions in landscapes and wetlands across the globe. Um, they offer near-term solutions to address hard to eliminate emissions, um, planting trees, soil management, grassland and wetland management, all have the opportunity to reduce the level of CO2 emissions. So in Houston, this means prairie land reforestation, urban forestation, um, parks management, and in other areas like that offer opportunities to reduce emissions for the city. And companies like BP and others offer solutions where emitters can invest in those sorts of projects that will reduce CO2 from the atmosphere as a way of offsetting emissions created by other activities. In the area of building optimization, technology companies and energy companies are coming together to leverage AI and data management systems that will help improve energy efficiency. We hear a lot about smart buildings and smart technology. And if we think about things like Nest thermostats, uh, electricity timers, automated sunshades for windows, and other types of technologies, we be, we're beginning to see in our homes um, that technology is being scaled to make offices, industrial facilities, and the like much more efficient. So achieving the CAP goals requires taking actions from all directions, whether it's clean and renewable energy development, emissions capturing technologies, uh, or improving energy efficiency. When it comes to meeting the climate challenge, we really do need an all of the above approach in, in every sense. And then in the area of materials management. One great example of how industry is helping to reduce waste and emissions is through waste to fuel technologies. So companies like Brightmark and Fulcrum Energy are partnering with, with uh, waste management companies like Waste Management and Republic Waste to convert waste, particularly waste that can't be recycled and convert it into either liquid fuel like biodiesel or into natural gas. And so that's another area where there's an opportunity um, to uh, create a, a more circular economy by, by continuing to use the products um, that would ultimately end up in our landfills. So this graphic represents BP's view of what a city like Houston could look like in the future if we collectively achieve our net zero goals. Achieving this vision will require everyone's participation as individuals, educators, companies, governments, and community organizations. The great news is that in Houston, we have so many companies and industries that are excited to help make this vision happen. In addition to the areas I highlighted, many of the energy companies in Houston support STEM and other educational programs and are helping to think through the skills and capabilities that we'll need as we transition to a net zero city. We also recognize that to be successful as an industry, we need to bring that new talent with capabilities into new areas that support the energy transition. And so that's really uh, what I wanted to cover today. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of the ways industry is working to help the city of Houston reach its cap goals. Happy to answer any questions that I can. Thanks, Jane. And instead of opening this up to the masses, I'm going to ask that if you have a few questions, would you please put them in the chat and then I'll filter through some of those to ask Jane. We can probably take one or two and then we will go to a transition. And I want to give a shout out to the biodiesel. I used to teach environmental science and engineering at Energy Institute High School and we made biodiesel. It was super fun and the kids really liked it. So you guys yeah. had some great resources that we actually use in our classroom. So thank you, Jane. Does anybody have any questions for her about the work that industry is taking on? Okay, Marshall, hold on. Let me read that for a second here. Can you see that, Jane? I can. What is the role 
BP, what is BP's role in other energy partners in reducing emissions at the source for Houstonians who face record high number of no school days due to emission related? It's very important to recognize. So I'd say, you know, one of the areas that is a, a primary focus um, for uh, carbon capture technology development is, is in the ship channel and in port decarbonization. So that is a key area um, for early development, looking at how can we um, work together with other industry partners to reduce the level of emissions that are coming specifically from those higher industrial areas. And I think in the near term, carbon capture technology is probably the most promising. Um, there are still a few challenges in terms of regulatory um, hurdles that need to be sorted, but I, I think you know that I, the recognition that that that's the source uh, that that's the biggest priority and the biggest opportunity for improvement in the near term. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jane, for answering that question for us. And so do we have any other quick questions in the chat here? I see all the chat about biodiesel. I know it's super fun. <laughs> I have a question about that. So let's say I'm a high school teacher because we have a few on the line today and they wanted to do something like um, introduce an industry professional to their students or talk about biodiesel. And let's say I'm not as well versed in that stuff because I didn't study it in school. That was, don't date myself, a long time ago. <laughs> Is there an opportunity to reach out to industry to get guest speakers in our classrooms? Or in yeah. part of our Formal programs. How do we do that? Do yeah, that? absolutely. I, I know, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's, um, that there's a single source for finding that expertise, but I know that, that BP participates in a couple of different STEM programs where we have uh, volunteer staff who are willing to go out and be subject matter experts and, and present on various topics. Um, I, I'm hopeful um, that through the youth working group, there might be an opportunity for us to, to help build something a little bit more um, holistic and uh, single source that will allow the, the youth organizations to, to access those resources um, across a broad range of companies that, um, particularly as we have new companies coming in, um, particularly in those areas of, of green innovation, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to leverage a lot of what's happening in that space to, to teach and, and learn about, you know, what are the skills that are needed to, to be prepared for this new, this new industry and clean energy. I love that you alluded to our youth engagement group, that they are going to have a key role in what's coming from this workshop, which I'll get to yeah. in a second. <laughs> so in the meantime, if some of my teachers out there, or I'm already looking at Nancy Brown, who wants to probably book you for a virtually wild program, how would we get in touch with somebody from industry? Do we just call up BP's 1-800 number, what can we do? <laughs> <laughs> Let me, um, so in the, in the near term, if, if uh, folks want to contact me, I can, uh, I will research and try to find out sort of at least from BP's perspective, how best to get um, through our talent acquisition team. We've been through a bit of a restructuring over the last few months. So um, I'm a bit reluctant to hand out names until after the first of the year when I know exactly who's still going to be around. So um, yeah. in, in the near term, I'm probably the best contact and I can get them in, in touch with the right folks. Well, Jane, we appreciate you being here and showing the work that's going on in industry as well. And I know that has some key tie-ins to the work that we are all up to. So thank you for sharing. Thanks for having me. And we're going to take a moment to transition here. Um, can you guys see that? That did some weird stuff to my screen when I did that. Somebody give me a heck yeah. I can't see the chat. Yes, all good. Oh, good. Good and hood. Okay, here we go. So for our final product feedback, I love that all of you have wonderful ideas and we do not have the opportunity for all of us to share those wonderful ideas out loud. One big space. So we're going to do it in a smaller space. And I'd like to introduce our new guy, Asamji. We are so glad to have him on board. And he's going to run you through some final feedback protocol so that we can get those ideas fleshed out. Asamji, why don't you explain to us what we're going to do next? Good morning, everyone. My name is Asamji Pinoja. I'm the new Texas Program Manager for EcoRise. I'm, I serve as Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. I presently are in Paraline, Texas, which is basically Houston. I just tell people Houston. Uh, so today we're going to be doing a critical friends protocol. I'm going to kind of curse, give you a cursory understanding of it. You have most of the information in front of you.
But the reason why we're using this, this is used in PBL very, very often to kind of flush out ideas and flush out thoughts around planning and coming up with a more in-depth analysis of your question. So its whole intent is to explore in depth again, the essential question. And the essential question today is, was placed by Karen, is how to integrate climate resilience into our curriculums. Right? So our conversation is intended to ensure clarity of purpose, uh, to question your own assumptions, and also to develop a proposed course of action for addressing the question. But most importantly, it gives us uh, a framework for how we should behave during this whole process. And basically, when the presenter's presenting, everyone else should be silent and reflective, maybe taking notes. If you have a notebook and a pen, if not, get a notebook and a pen or some paper and a pen and take notes as the person's presenting. But we should be silent throughout the whole process. And the process has six components. I won't go in depth into them because we're kind of short on time. But the first part is the project overview. So the presenter will present their question and how they're going to implement it into their curriculum. The second part, well, the that part, the presenter is the only one that speaks. Everyone else just listens, OK? The second part is cl the clarifying questions. As the participants are listening, they're coming up with questions that can kind of flush out better ideas or flush out how to rethink or think better about the question that was posed. The third part is the probing questions. And this is where participants ask probing questions of the presenter. Like for instance, what made you decide on selecting this particular project would be a great probing question. The fourth part will be the discussion. And partic participants discuss the work that have been presented, explore solutions and direct their comments to each other not the presenter, to each other, and that's key, right? The presenter, your job at that point is to relax, kick back, take a couple sips of your tea, and just be quiet and silent and listen, okay? So the presenter, the participants can speak openly and engage with each other in authentic conversation, and they can think of uh, maybe asking questions that allows the presenter to think in a way of, for example, it's helpful to begin with what went well, there are any of your concerns, and maybe if we have time, maybe take a survey, this is for the, um, the presenter, take a survey of what the group would or would not want you to do or would, want not, would not want you to see in your presentation. And the last, from the sixth component, is the debriefing. And this is where everyone gets a chance to talk um, and talk about the successes of the presentation. Okay. Are there any questions? If there's any questions, you can unmute yourself or put them in the chat and I'll be able to see them. If not, I will continue. Okay, fantastic. I, Asamji, I have a question. So if I've never done this feedback protocol and I'm feeling a little bit nervous about this, is that normal? That's very, very normal. Do not, do not uh, let that hinder you from the process. It's very, very normal to be nervous when you're doing something for the first time. If anything, just sit and observe and listen, and then you could be able to utilize this process. This process is throughout the web. You can find information about it. Um, so you can, after this uh, workshop, you can go on and do as much research as you want. But for now, if you feel nervous, just relax and, and, and enjoy the process. So Asamji, I have another question. What if I sat through all of the workshops and I haven't really thought about how I'm going to do this with my program yet, but I have some general brainstorm. What should I do? Oh, write them down. You have time now to write them down. And hopefully at some point at the end, if we have a Q&A section of this or maybe present in the chat, you can kind of ask us all generally and maybe someone will be able to explain or answer your question. So you're saying in my feet, in my breakout room, that would be a great chance for me to present some of these ideas I'm mulling over during my initial presentation time. Correct. Okay. Okay, well with that, Christy, I think you're gonna send us all to a room. Was, all right, now Christy says everybody's back. Hey everyone, welcome back. And on behalf of the whole squad that put all of this together today, I just wanna say thank you for joining us. And I have a few next steps for us. This will all be copied and pasted into an email that we'll send out sometime this afternoon so you have all of these links, which Christy's also gonna drop here in the chat for you. So in closing today, 
we know there's lots of ideas out there. So we're gonna start collecting them in a Google form. And it was just meant to be a, a generic Google form to collect those ideas. If it doesn't work for you, just send me an email and attach whatever you need to in an email, that works too. And then we have a youth engagement committee, which has been alluded to a few times this morning. And that youth engagement committee is going to review these programs. So let's say I'm alluding to Virtually Wild, which is you know my little, Nancy and I's little baby. We're gonna run some of these ideas by that youth engagement committee because they're gonna give us some real honest feedback. And then once that feedback comes in, they have a meeting in January, we will send that back out to you and your program so you can do some modifications based on that feedback. If you wanna be a part of that youth engagement committee, um, don't send, oh, you can send me an email and I'll pass it on to the folks that it needs to go to. We are also gonna take these resources as Cindy had a great point, let's aggregate all of it together. So we're gonna put that in two places. We're gonna put it on here in Houston, which is a growing resource. And then the greenhoustontexas.gov website. So we have all of it in two locations so that we hopefully then can all start referring to that when we refer to climate and resiliency education. We wanna, we know that our programs don't fit the needs of our individually for our community, but if maybe collectively we start promoting these programs then we're gonna fit a lot more folks needs. And then we're also gonna send you this logo that you see in the top corner. Be part of the program and you can use the logo as part of your resources and say, look, we're part of the Climate Action Plan. We are part of the solution. And so we'd love to use that logo and those hashtags you see there to promote um, what's coming from this workshop. You'll see here a few workshops that I already know are being mulled over. NWF is gonna host a few resiliency summits. And if you wanna be a part of that, email Karen um, Fowler. That's Maria Fowler. Christy's going to drop it in the chat. Not Karen, Maria. I know the Children's Environmental Literacy Foundation is going to do some teacher symposiums based specifically on Houston and resiliency. And then if you're going to offer any PDs or any sort of workshops, would you please make sure that you send those in to me and I'll get them out to the community so that we can hopefully increase our reach and our impact. And then last but not least, we do have a survey for today. We'd like a little bit of feedback. What did you guys think? And Christy's gonna drop that survey monkey in there. Thanks, Christy. And so in closing today, again, I'll send all this out so that you have it in email form, unless you wanna copy and paste some of those, those tabs real quick. I appreciate all of you guys sharing your ideas, but make sure I'm not gonna copy and paste this whole chat function. So make sure you send in those great ideas to that Google form or send me an email so that I have them all in one place. Christy, did you have any closing? Closing I thoughts? do. I actually, I know that once we walk away, we all go back into our busy lives and we want to make sure that these workshops are as, as functional and as useful as possible. And so um, we all know that more heads are better than a small group of heads. And so um, let's all take about two to three minutes to fill that in now. Um, once you fill that in so that we know it's done, I would love for you to think of an intention that you have from what you've done today, what is your very next step in connecting to the climate plan? So survey, and then in the chat window, tell us your next, your, your next intention. What is, let's, let's set it. What is the very next thing you're going to do um, to put some of this in action? So I wanna take this time to thank everybody uh, that participated in this workshop. Um, this is just a start. Uh, our intention is to continue the work and, um, and sky's the limit. So um, thank you everybody for attending and thank you so much to our partners, um, uh, Alicia, Christy, everybody that worked to get this uh, workshop together. The city of Houston thanks you so, so much. Um, Dodie, Michelle, everybody. So, um, and our participants. So thank you so much. And uh, we will talk soon. And um, don't forget to sign up for the working groups. Uh, we need your help. The city needs uh, the community. So uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed yourself and, um, and uh, learned something new. So thank you. <laughs>